We are launching a brand new series today, so if you're just joining us, nice, good job, well done. Uh, we're gonna kick off a series that's actually gonna take us all the way through the end of the year, almost, right? It's a massive series, and we're gonna be walking through the Gospel of Mark. Now, the reason why that's so important, and I titled the message, The Greatest Opportunity. The whole series is called The Greatest Opportunity, because in the year of opportunity here at Bridgeway, there's no one that did it better than Jesus. So we're gonna spend the whole entire year kind of examining how did he so seamlessly walk in the Father's will? How did he so seamlessly walk in the power and authority of the Holy Spirit? Almost to where it seemed normal every day for him to have these incredible divine appointments. And you're like, well, he's God, of course. Hold on, he wasn't using his deity. He was giving us an example of how we ought to live. And yet you see in three short years, not only did he die for the sins of the world, which was of course the bigger issue, but even his ministry transformed the planet. And what I'm trying to say is I believe that we can have our eyes opened. We can redial in to begin to see the movement of God, hear the voice of the Holy Spirit, and begin to walk right into those partnerships what I don't want is to give you the feeling I want you to do more, stress out more. No, not at all. I don't want you to work harder. I want you to change your mindset so you can naturally, with a light burden, not a heavy one, walk right into those divine appointments that are already surrounding you. Already God has set up stuff for you. It's just a matter of saying, yes, Lord, each and every day. That's what this series is about. That's what this year is about. Now, I wanna get you to the fill in the blank for today's message that I entitled The Opportunity for More was simply this. One of the greatest travesties of mankind is our willingness to live as less than what God intended for us. I'll say that again. One of the greatest travesties of mankind is our willingness to live as less than God intended for us. You say, well, what do you mean? I'll give you some examples. When trauma identifies us while God waits with healing in the wings. When fear and depression dictate our joy, yet Jesus is the Prince of Peace regardless of circumstance. When human lives are frittered away in meaninglessness instead of walking in the predetermined plan of God that is filled with purpose. When addictions and habits keep us trapped in a small cage. When God broke us free to roam the world with him. When we think that our lack of resources hinders God from doing great things. When we allow toxic relationships to shape us more than who God tells us we are. These are less than what God wants. Here's the fill in the blank. God has more for you. God has more for you. I'm gonna be the one to beat that drum all year long. God has more for you. No matter what you think right now, God has more for you. If you have had a certain amount of healing, God has more. If you have had some type of freedom, God has more. If you have had incredible Christian experiences, God has more for you. If you have seen depth of relationships, God has more for you. He has more grace. He has more love than you can ever imagine. So no matter how long you walk with God on this planet, there is always more. There's always more. So I will push that over and over because what I never want you to do is to settle for something you imagined and didn't go to what God imagined for you. I truly believe that he wants us to be fully free, fully healthy, fully whole, strong, empowered, and walking in our identity. And I believe the Holy Spirit's not gonna let up until we're free enough in his mind. Amen? Amen? Amen. So we're starting a brand new book today. What that means is we gotta know the context. We're not scripture divers. We don't just open up the Bible randomly and not have any thoughts about it. We wanna know kind of why God put it in there. What was the scenario? Who wrote it? Stuff like that. So we're gonna do a simple examination but in order to do so, I wanna highlight the fact that 
There are a number of accounts of Jesus' story. They're called, we call them the Gospels. Does anybody know how many there are in the New Testament? Yeah, there's four. Anybody know the names of them? It's Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. There you go. So in those four, you have to ask the question, why four? I mean, it just seems like kind of overkill. If you read from Matthew through, you begin to start going, man, I feel like I've heard this story before. Like, what the heck? We already did this one. And then it goes again. As a matter of fact, the first three are called synoptic. That actually means similar. Matthew, Mark, Luke, they're actually very, very similar. So you have to ask, why are we repeating ourselves three times, I mean, four times? You would basically say, I get it, Jesus did stuff. Okay, hold on. Unless you understand the nuances of each one, you're not gonna fully appreciate why we need all four. So let me give you an example. Matthew was a disciple. Anybody know his original name? Levi, Levi the tax collector. He ended up getting saved. His name was changed to Matthew. And he was one that walked with Jesus. He's the perfect one to go first because he is a Jew writing for Jews. He is a connection to the Old Testament. He quotes the Old Testament more than anybody else. And his whole focus is to explain that Jesus is the rightful king of the Jews. So he's going to talk about what Jesus said. He's the one that gives the really long statements that sound like they came from Yoda. You know what I'm talking about? Those really long cryptic, you're like, I don't even understand what you're talking to me right now, okay? All that is in Matthew because he's using allusions and idioms and all these crazy things that the Jewish people would understand. That was his crew. The second one that we're covering this year is Mark. This is the action, short, get in there, get out. The whole focus is on the actions of Jesus less than the teachings of Jesus. And his purpose is to explain that Jesus is the authoritative servant. In other words, he is the representative of all mankind. His genealogy kicks back to Adam and says, hey everybody, Jesus isn't just for the Jewish people, he's for everyone. And therefore, we all see him as savior. He is both human and God in order to die for our sins and save us. Luke, the next one, is actually the longest book in the New Testament. Mark, that we're studying, is half the size of Luke. That's how different they are. Luke is interesting because he's the only outsider. He's a Gentile writing to Gentiles. He actually goes through like a journalist. If you ever thought about, well, how would, the, how would this certain periodical examine Jesus? It's this guy. He said, hey, I wasn't part of the original crew. I went back, pulled all the facts, pulled all the eyewitnesses, and I'm gonna write an orderly account of who Jesus was. And at the end of the day, I need to explain to you his favorite name for himself was Son of Man. So I need everyone to understand this. He is the savior of all mankind, Jew, Gentiles and Jews. John is the weird one. They put him last, and the only reason he ended up writing at all, because you gotta remember, he was one of Jesus' close friends, right? He's the one that laid back on the chest of Jesus at the Last Supper the beloved. The only reason he wrote it all was it seems that the first three didn't fully cover the fact that Jesus is God well enough. He focuses on signs, wonders, miracles, and he wants everyone to know that his best friend was far more than a man. He was God. When you see those four perspectives, you begin to realize, well, thank the Lord we have all four. A number of years ago, I compiled them all together because I thought how beautiful it would be to get the four of them in a room together. And we could kind of go through all four at one time. It was a super cool idea. 
and it took two and a half years. That's right. It was a hundred part series that many of you are still scarred from. I get it. I get it. So this time we're only doing one. We're going to keep it within one year and y'all won't die. Praise God. All right. Amen. So who is John Mark, right? We look at it as Mark, but his real name is John. So John Mark is an interesting character. He was a young guy when he came on the scene. He, his mom was a believer. There was a church in her home. Whether or not everybody got saved through Paul's ministry or whether or not Mark got saved through Paul's ministry, we don't know. His cousin is Barnabas, one of the apostles. Incredible man. He and Paul, when they went on their first missionary journey, brought John Mark along. Everybody remember that story? And he was all in until it got weird. The minute it got sketchy, he was like, I'm out. And he bailed. And Paul was like, you are dead to me. I mean, just he was super harsh. And they split over that. You find out later on they reconnected and Paul refers to John Mark as precious to him. But what's most interesting about Mark's account is that he later gets heavily connected to Peter, who was a disciple. As a matter of fact, he was the leader of the disciples. And so everyone from all the way from about 120 AD till now has realized the gospel of Mark is actually the gospel through Peter's eyes. So if you wanna know why John Mark wrote, it was for Peter, who was there the whole time. All right. Let's keep moving forward. It was written and sent from Rome, Italy, and we're diving in now. Would you turn with me to Mark chapter one, verse one. Mark chapter one, verse one. If you don't have a Bible, there should be one under the seat in front of you. And you're gonna turn to page 836, 836. If you brought your own Bible, drop it open in the middle, go to the right. You're gonna go super far to the right. Matthew, Mark, if you hit Luke, you went too far. All right, we're only gonna go through verses one through eight, but as you know, in a preacher's mind, one verse is as a thousand years. Praise the Lord. <laughs> I'm gonna suggest to you this opening verse, this opening passage, could be a passage that you could chew on for the rest of your life and you pretty much have everything you need. It's that powerful of a, Opening line. You want to talk about a good line for an opening for a book. This is a great one. And it goes like this. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Huh. Now that's something we would just read and blow past, but it's all right there. What do I mean? The beginning, you're like, oh, come on, dude. Now you're making a whole bunch out of this. He's just like, and I'm starting. Okay, I got you. But let me highlight something for you. There's no way you're gonna read the Bible and read the words, the beginning, and not think of Genesis 1.1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, right? Well, how does John start his gospel? In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God. Verse 14 says, and the word became flesh and dwelt with us, that's who? Jesus Christ. There's no way you're gonna see the words beginning and not be drawn to the fact that God is always the beginning of the story. Whatever story you're involved in, you're late. God was already on it a long time ago. And here's the only part I wanna highlight for you as a matter of comfort. There will never be a scenario, a challenge in your life that is going to catch God off guard. There is no challenge in your life. He doesn't already have a plan in place by the time you recognized it was a problem. You're always late to the story. He's already on it. You know it because he told you. So this whole idea where we gotta go to prayer and we gotta now tell God that we're desperate. No, the reason you know you're desperate is he told you you're desperate. You always have God watching over you even when you're not paying attention. While you're sleeping, he's on. While you're scared, he's on. While you're traveling, he's with you. You are never out of his sight. You are never out of his heart. He's always on it, and he's way ahead of you. Amen? Amen. It says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ. 
And this is the key word, right? The gospel. Because in the church, we use that all the time. Hey, do you know the gospel? Well, it's interesting because I think in order to realize the power of the word, let's go back to where it started from. Christians didn't make that word up. We ripped it off. We ripped off most of our words. Let's be very clear on that, right? It was a Roman word, evangel, right? And what it meant to them was joyful news. That's why we call it the good news. But here's what's interesting. For them, it had a very specific context. It was used for events that involved the emperor. And here's what it ultimately meant. We're gonna have a party because our emperor's in charge because when he came to power, he changed everything, and aren't we blessed because he's here? That's the word gospel. Christians were like, wait a second. When our Jesus showed up, he changed everything. When our ruler showed up, man, he changed reality. Wait a second, everything's better because Jesus came. That's our word. And they grabbed it and held onto it tightly. That's where the word gospel comes from. So when I ask you the question, what is the gospel? What does it mean for the Christian? This is where all the Bible nerds come out. They, everybody's like, I know the answer. Jesus died for our sins and we can have eternal life. Nailed it. <laughs> well, kinda. Now the extra nerds would be like, well, actually in 1 Corinthians 15. 1 Corinthians 15, give us the facts of the gospel. It says that at the right time, Jesus Christ came here and he lived the perfect life and he died for our sins. And as, as according to prophecy, he rose on the third day and then he appeared first to the disciples and then to many. That's the gospel. I'm like, all right, sit down, right? <laughs> Nobody needs to hear you, all right? Now, What's interesting about that is that you go, okay, so if we boil it down, it's still Jesus Christ died for the sins of the world, and we have the opportunity of eternal life. And you go, that's the gospel. And here's my point, sort of. Hmm. In verse 14 that we're gonna handle next week, it says what Matthew's gospel says, which is simply this. And Jesus went about through all the villages and cities and preached the gospel of the kingdom and healed people. All right, so let's pause. How exactly is the gospel the death and resurrection of Jesus if Jesus preached the gospel and wasn't telling anyone about his death and resurrection? You sure you know what the gospel means? What gospel did Jesus teach? It was before all that. He didn't tell anybody he was gonna die and raise again except for his closest buddies, right? That was a secret. So if you're gonna try to tell the gospel and you're gonna take out the death and resurrection part, do you have anything to say? And here's my point. Are we selling the gospel short? Because I think there's more. I think there's more to the gospel. Is part of the gospel, and I would argue the most important part of the gospel, that ultimately Jesus Christ died for our sins and we have eternal life. Yes, what I'm telling you is, if that's your only message, then everybody has to wait for benefits until they die. Jesus told a more full gospel, which was what? Stuff changed for now, not just when you die. And this is kind of what I want to get into. Because I think that when Jesus talked about the gospel, the good news was there's a new king in town. He showed up and he treated people different. The Jews had had one bad leader after another bad leader and he came in with good news and said a new ruler has showed up and everything is about to change. And when I operate, you'll see how different it is. You see, before Jesus, sickness, did or did not lead to death, but there wasn't any healing available. All of a sudden, he shows up and starts healing people now, not when they die. There was, before Jesus, varying degrees of demonization, but nobody had the corner market on getting rid of them until Jesus showed up and he said, you know we can take care of that today, right? You see, Jesus had come. Now heaven 
is present on earth. Now there's a different reality at play. For us today, post-Pentecost, we argue the Holy Spirit has gone worldwide and is operating through believers all the time, which means nobody in the world should ever be too far from God's help because God's ambassadors, Christians, should be in your proximity, and they're the ones carrying the power and authority of Jesus Christ today. Now, help and hope is present, not just when you die, right now. Yes, the greatest hope is that we will have eternal life. The hope we need to highlight for people is there's a benefit even today. This is one of the reasons why I push supernatural ministry so much at Bridgeway. You know, there's a lot of Christian streams that don't engage with supernatural ministry. And as a matter of fact, I can have mad respect for them for a variety of areas. Here's my problem with it. If you take out supernatural ministry, everybody has to wait till they die to have anything cool happen. What I'm interested in is cool stuff happening right now. Because as a human being, I have hurts today that if God wants to take care of them, he can take care of them. I don't actually have to wait to die to get some things. Will it be more awesome when I pass away? Yes, it will. But is there not hope and help today? I believe that that's why Christians are all spread out. We're supposed to be the salt and light of the world. We're supposed to make a difference now, not only when everyone dies. And the problem with that is how we share the gospel with people. We usually only focus on the death and resurrection, so usually our interactions with our friends are awkward. Here's how it normally comes up. Hey, I don't know you very well, but I'm a Christian. I need to tell you, you are more sick than you ever imagined. You have a disease you didn't know you have. I'm sorry, what's that? You have sin, and you're condemned to hell. Oh, hi. Nice to meet you. Now, good news is, Jesus is the source of the cure of the disease you didn't know you had. Okay, thank you. And when you die, (laughs) it could be awesome. (laughs) Okay, does anyone understand how that's a little weird (laughs) to, to somebody that doesn't know anything about this? As opposed to saying it this way, hey, did you know that the God who created us really loves you a whole bunch? Did you know that when he sent his son, Jesus Christ, everything changed, and he's all about you? Do you realize that he's interested in blessing you and making you alive right here, right now? That there's a quality of life I don't even think you've walked into. And I gotta tell you, there's more blessing, more love, more encouragement, more strength than you can ever imagine. I think we were built for more. And when Jesus Christ came, he said, let's go, kids, we can do this. Let me take over the reins of your life and I will make you what I always designed you to be. And as a matter of fact, if you are willing to surrender to all of that and the he takes over, he can cleanse you from every single stain of sin and actually he transforms you, makes you come alive in all of your systems and that walks out forever. As a matter of fact, death has no touch on you because you will always be in the presence of God. Is that not a different way to present the gospel? Yeah, and it makes a lot more sense to somebody who hasn't been to theology school, amen? Amen. Verse two. Thank you, thank you. I would change your lunch plans. As it is written in Isaiah the prophet, behold, I send my messenger before your face who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord and make his path straight. Pause, anybody understand that one? Nope, that's a Yoda one. And you're like, man, just say what you're trying to say. Why do you have to quote something so weird? And the answer is, because it's cooler this way. All right, great. So who is Isaiah? He just quoted Isaiah. This is an Old Testament prophet who lived 700 years before this story. So we're quoting some old stuff. Now to us, it's 2,700 years ago, so we're really talking old school. This guy, Isaiah, 
He was sharing some things deep about God. And so we say, where is that quoted in his book? Well, it's actually chapter 40, verse three. But what's fascinating about that quote is it's actually a mashup of three different passages. It was said in Exodus, it was said in Malachi, and it was said in Isaiah. When you look at all three of them, you get a more well-rounded picture of why in the world Mark would quote that passage right here to start his entire gospel. And you find out the reason is to create a bridge between the Old Testament and the New Testament. So he jumps back, grabs the Old Testament, and says, hey, something happening now in my world ties into what was said before. So let's go through that for a moment. When it was said in Isaiah's day, it was a comfort to Israel. Hey guys, things are not going great, but one day God's gonna come and he's gonna fix it. When it was Malachi's time to say the same thing, he's like, hey guys, things aren't going great and we're in trouble. And when God shows up, oh, trust me, he's gonna fix it, <laughs> right? And they were like, yee. When it was said in Exodus, it was a promise that when they were in the wilderness, God would send his guiding presence to get them safely to their location. You go, so I don't understand. So why would Mark use all of that? Because it's saying things aren't right, but God's going to make them right. And what's interesting about it is all of them have three key elements, wilderness, guiding, and fixing. Is that important? Well, it really does, because you're gonna find out Mark starts his entire gospel in the wilderness. Why is the wilderness important? Because to the Jews, that's where they had the birthplace of their nation. You guys remember this story? We start out, and all Jews came from the lineage of one man. Anybody know his name? Abraham. Abraham. If you go through the patriarchs, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. By the time we get there, there's a ton. I mean, it should be, it starts out as really, really small, but you find out they start to multiply really rapidly, and they are in the country of Egypt. By the time Moses comes on the scene, there are about 600,000 Jews. Well, along the way, that made Egypt really nervous. And so they ended up enslaving them. And that's where we get that whole story, right? The Ten Commandments movie, right? All that stuff. Because they were treated very poorly, but they were still known as the Hebrew people. God said, I'm getting you guys out of here. Just rains down havoc on the Egyptian empire. 10 plagues. They get a chance to get out. Anybody remember what body of water they cross? The Red Sea. It opens up and they go through it out into where? The wilderness. And there at the foot of Mount Sinai, God meets them and says, hey kiddos, you're now a nation. They're like, no we're not, we're slave people. He said, not in my eyes. You are the nation of the Jewish people and you're mine. I'm gonna give you new codes, I'm gonna give you new rules, I'm gonna give you new organization, I'm gonna give you a plan that by the time I am done walking you through this desert, we're gonna walk to the promised land and every other nation is gonna fear you because they're gonna go, oh my goodness, what nation is that? And it was the beginning of the Jewish nation. Wilderness is hard, wilderness is transformational, but wilderness is the beginning of the Jewish story. Is that important? Yeah, because when Jesus comes, we're starting a whole new story, and it always begins in the wilderness. It says, I will send my messenger. When I'm ready to fix it, I will send my messenger. Which messenger? Well, actually, Malachi's super clear on it. He says, quote, Elijah. Now, problem with Elijah is he lived 450 years before Malachi, which means by the time this story is up, it was 875 years ago. It's not like he's gonna come back up. He's pretty dead dead, right? So you're going, I don't understand. So God, how are you gonna send Elijah when the dude died a long time ago? 
Is he gonna be like a, a resurrected Elijah? And he's like, hold on, hold on, I'm being poetic. No, one like Elijah is going to come. And you're like, oh, he should have just said that. That would have been awesome. <laughs> What's he gonna do? He's gonna prepare the way for the Lord. Prepare the way for the Lord, how? He's gonna get everybody ready for the king to walk in. Basically, a forerunner does this. Oh my gosh, the king's coming, the king's coming. I mean, I don't know if you need to change your clothes, I don't know if you need to get your present ready, but here comes the king, he's gonna come. I want everybody to get ready. Here comes the king, here comes the king. So that when the king arrives, people don't scramble. They're already ready for him to show up. And you go, what does that have to do with me? This is your job. If you're a Christian, you're a forerunner of Jesus. You're never gonna save anybody, is that correct? So what good are you? You're the one that's going to tell everybody, hey, when the king shows up, he's gonna change your life. Hey, when the king shows up, he's gonna change your life. He changed my life, and you know what? I can't save you, but he can. As a matter of fact, I can't fix all your problem, but he can. And your job is to talk up Jesus so when the Holy Spirit comes upon him, it sounds familiar. And they get saved by him. Our job is to just set the table and let Jesus hang out with them, amen? That's what we do. Pick it up in verse four. And so John appeared. Wait, what? Well, God's gonna send Elijah, and John appeared. Okay. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of southern Israel, Judea, and all the city of Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the Jordan River, and they were confessing their sins. Man, that sounds like a revival. And you got people flooding, Jews flooding out to the wilderness to go meet with this dude. To do what? To get baptized. Okay, hold on a second. It says, so there was stuff in the Old Testament, we're just starting the New Testament, and John shows up. Wait, 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 what happened in the interim? Between the Old Testament and the New Testament, there's roughly 400 years. What happened then? God went silent. Last prophet to speak was Malachi. And then there were 400 years of silence. But that was a very crazy time in regular secular history. As a matter of fact, you know more about that period of history than maybe you ever imagined. Why? Because it was a time that a guy arose by the name of Alexander the Great. Anybody ever heard of him? Yeah, what empire did he bring up? The Greek Empire. After him rose what empire? The Roman Empire, which was in place when Jesus and John showed up. All of that actually got set during that middle period. So there was a lot going on, but God wasn't talking. And what's interesting is you say, all right, so how did the Old Testament end? Well, there's actually two ways to look at it. In one sense, you can just open your Bible and go, well, clearly, dude, it ended with Malachi. It's the end of the Old Testament, right? And you go, okay, so let's take that for a moment. What is the end of Malachi? Here's how it ends. Hey, Jewish people, we sure blew it, didn't we? Well, now we actually know that God's gonna have to fix this, but here we go. We're gonna kind of do a do-over, right? As a matter of fact... It says that Malachi says a direct prophecy that God's gonna send an Elijah the prophet who would usher in the great day of the Lord. But then nobody knows if it worked. And then all of a sudden John shows up and Jesus shows up and you start realizing this is the fulfillment of those last words. Okay, you go, well, what's the other way to look at it? I was stumbled across an article by the Bible Project. Anybody know the Bible Project? It is one of the coolest ministries ever. Their theology is legit, and they do crazy Bible teaching. If you wanna know anything about Bible easy, go to the Bible Project online, they're amazing. So I get into this article, and they highlighted something I hadn't remembered in a long time, and it was simply this. When Jesus read the Old Testament, it was not the order of books we have today. As a matter of fact, it was way later that they mixed them around. The New Testament and the Old Testament actually are organized according to theme. 
So the Old Testament actually is genre-based. Starts out with the first five books of Moses, then it goes to uh, history literature, then it goes to wisdom literature, then it goes to major prophets, then it goes to minor prophets. It has nothing to do with order of, of uh, chronology. It's actually only in genre. When they reshifted it around, Malachi ended up at the end, but that's not how Jesus read it. Back in Jesus' day, it ended with Second Chronicles. Why is that important? Because it ends with an incomplete sentence. It actually says, so Jews, we blew it, I get it. We went into exile for 70 years, but there's this new king in town of the Persian empire named Cyrus, and he's gonna let us go back home to try again. Cliffhanger. It literally just ends. You go, so did it work? And then all of a sudden we have the New Testament. And here's the truth, it didn't work. What we find out is that as much as God tried to reset them over the 70 year exile, the hearts weren't changed. They went right back to the same pattern. As a matter of fact, a rather unusual pattern emerged. If you go back to the very last time the Jewish people were aligned with God, it involves the life of David and Solomon. If you take the last period that they were aligned with God, you find out they break for 490 years. Why 49? Because it's all about sevens. 490 years of disobedience and then God said, time out. Put him in exile for how long? 70 years, because it's all about sevens. Tries to restart them, guess what? It didn't work. How long did it not work? Another 490 years. Lead you right to the time that Jesus was born. I'm sure it's an accident, but <laughs> how fascinating, <laughs> right? I mean, are you not seeing the orchestration of God? I mean, this is insane to me. So it says, so John the Baptist shows up and it says, and he started baptizing in the wilderness. Why would he do that? Why the wilderness? There's a million pools in, in the Israel region. Why would you go to the Jordan River? It's nasty. His point was, get out here in the wilderness. This is where we start stuff. It was a return to the sonship of God. It was, we're going to change everything. And he started baptizing. You're like, well, clearly his name was John the Baptist. You should have known. <laughs> no, we named him that afterwards, all right? He didn't come up with the name right off the bat. So you say, well, was baptism new? The answer is kind of. He did baptism by immersion, which means he lowered somebody all the way under the water. And you go, okay, well, that, that wasn't new. People did that in his day. Yep, that's true. But here's where it was different. The Jewish people were masters at water cleansing. They knew how to rinse, wash. There were mikvahs by the temple. There was a bronze laver by the uh, sacrificial altar. They were so good at knowing how to ritually purify the outside by washing. Every once in a while it would come in, they had to cleanse the priest and it was washing over his whole body. They knew all of that, but they didn't do immersion. The only people that got immersed were Gentiles. You see, when you wanted to become a Jew, you had a three things you needed to do. Offer sacrifices, get circumcised, and be immersed. So what was so different about John is he called Jews to get immersed. And that was a pride problem. They're like, dude, I don't go all the way under. I'm God's people, you can wash me up, but I don't need to get completely doused. And he said, you know what, I think you do. You know what, I do. All of us at the foot of God, none of us are good enough. I don't care who you are, where you came from, I'm gonna suggest to you, you need to get all the way dunked. And he did something weird. And he was telling Jews, you have to surrender so far down that I will completely immerse you like you're going into the tomb and coming back out again. Wow, that's crazy. As a matter of fact, 
One of my favorite things about how we do baptism today and the whole immersion process here at Bridgeway, or probably across the world, is that when you don't ever baptize yourself, like if you, if you could ever baptize yourself, that means you'd get baptized every time you jump in the pool, right? You're like, baptized, baptized, okay? Little kids are like, baptized. You know, they're just jumping in over and over. Dogs are like, baptized, okay. Anyway, you don't ever baptize yourself. You have another person lower you down, right? Why is that? My favorite word picture that it creates is dead people can't do anything on their own. You're so dead in your sin, somebody else has to lower you down. Now, once you meet Jesus down there, you can spring up any way you want, because you're alive now. But you can't get down there yourself. Somebody has to lower you. Isn't that a beautiful picture? I think that's incredible. So, the thing I need to highlight is that baptism has two definitions, and I need you to memorize these. They're very short. Number one means dunking under, right? And you go, well, why does Bridgeway do immersion as opposed to sprinkling or pouring, which by the way, we consider both of those legitimate. Why do we do immersing? Because we can, and because it's the most natural meaning of the term, dunk under. That's it, I mean, it's not all that big, right? I like the picture, I like the visual picture, I like a bunch of it, right? So we immerse. Second definition, identified with. Why is that important? Because when you get baptized at Bridgeway, you're baptized publicly. We all clap for you, why is that? Because you're not only identified with God, you're also identified with us. So you are part of our team. Does that make sense? All right, that's super important in a moment. It says, and he proclaimed a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. What's repentance? It's simple. It means figure out you're going the wrong direction if you're focused on you and realign your direction and heart to God. That's it, change your mind, change your focus. That's what repentance is. Make the necessary adjustment. Why? Because you are going your direction, not God's direction, so we need a change. That's what repentance means. What's interesting though is it says, and while they did so, they confessed their sins. What does that mean? It means they owned up to their stuff. They acknowledged and verbalized what they had done wrong. They were owning their choices, owning their behaviors that are sinful. And this is where everyone goes, oh, that's the part I don't like. I hate that, that's embarrassing. That makes me feel shamed. That makes me feel guilty. Okay, well, hold on a second. Yes, you owning your stuff is difficult, but there's two things you gotta keep in mind and why I think confession is a great idea. Number one, you're never telling God something he didn't already watch. Seems kind of silly to go, oh, I don't really want to admit it. He watched it. The awkwardness is already done. You're just calling it out, right? Number two, it was his idea in the first place and he's waiting with a towel of grace going, kiddo, I've already seen it. I already got it. Actually, I'm just waiting to clean you off. You want to go or not? The Bible says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Why would we not wanna call it out so he can rub us clean and pour grace all over our head? That's pretty amazing, amen? All right, so let's close this out. It says, now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. That's weird. Seems like a good will shopper to me. You're just like, what the heck? Why do we care what he's wearing? This is stupid. Here's why, he's wearing a uniform. And that's what you missed. He's wearing a uniform, whose uniform? Oh, interesting, if you go back to the book of 2 Kings, here's what you find out. That's Elijah's uniform. As a matter of fact, there's a story that says a king who didn't like Elijah says, hey, I heard you were talking to a prophet. And he's like, yeah, we were. And he's like, what did he look like? And he's wearing like this garment of hair and he had a leather belt around his waist. He went, that's Elijah, I hate that guy. So how fascinating that Elijah was gonna be the forerunner of the new king. And here comes a guy dressed just like him, walking out in the wilderness and going, our king's coming. That's why it's mentioned. 
the whole bug eating thing, he was a doomsday prepper. <laughs> that is not true. Okay, let's pick it up. <laughs> All right, here we go, verse seven. It says, and he preached saying, after me comes he who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. What was his mention? Well, I mean, excuse me, what was his message? His message was simply this. Hey guys, I'm nobody. But who I'm telling you about, he's everybody. Man, don't get your eyes on me. Who cares about me? As a matter of fact, I'm not even worthy to do the most menial task to this, to this guy who's coming. I don't even yet know who it is, I'll tell you that, but when he walks up, he's gonna blow your mind. I have done all this stuff to get you ready, but if you wanna talk about real transformation, I washed you, he can transform you from the inside out. He will baptize you with the Holy Spirit of God. Okay, quiz. What are the two definitions of baptism? Number one is what? Dunking under. Number two is? Identify. What does it mean? I identified you with getting ready. He's going to identify you with the Holy Spirit. He's going to make a way that you might have the Holy Spirit come into your life. You will be a walking temple. You will be cleaned and made new in a way you never even imagined. He will do things to you with his fire that will burn out all impurities. He will make you of a whole nother level that I'm telling you, this one that is coming, this Messiah, this anointed one, I'm telling you, he's going to change our lives and he's going to do the impossible. Man, amen. There's more. And I'm going to tell you all year. There's more. There's more. There's more. Praise God that we serve a Lord who's so high and lifted up, you can never get to the end of him. He's got creativity for you. He has plans for you. He's got healing for you. He's got miracles for you. Please don't ever think he's done with you, because he's not. Can I have the prayer team come on up here at the front? If you need prayer, after I say amen, man, this front is open for you. We're ready to go. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we sure love you. We are so thankful that you sent your one and only son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sins. We want that to be effective, Jesus, that everything that you died for, we want it to be true for us. Would you heal us? Would you transform us? Would you pour your grace upon us? Would you cleanse us from every sin and every debt? Would you allow the blood from your brow and your side, would you allow the blood from your hands and your feet and your wrists pour down deep symbolically into the darkest places of us and make us well? Would you heal us of our trauma? Would you set us free? Would you give us victory in all areas? Lord, that we might glorify your name, that we might walk with you. Holy Spirit, the place has been open for you to flood into us. Thank you for taking that opportunity. Thank you, Holy Spirit, for anointing us and firing us up, filling us up, May you fill us afresh as we go out and take every opportunity you give us. In the name of Jesus, we pray, amen.